Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the next installment of project management. Andrew has an excused absence tonight, and I'm not sure uh, if Jake was involved in that, and, and Larry as well. And I, I know uh, Jake's got something else going on in his home life. He may have told me about it, and I forgot. I think so. Yeah, okay. All right, well, that uh, is a few gaps. Callie, welcome back. And uh, we will, uh, we're working on network diagramming, and we're gonna continue to work on it a little bit. You have an assignment uh, that is pending. It will be due a week from today uh, with your team, and we had one team that had four, that was team one. Uh, Callie can join team two. You weren't here, right? Yeah, so who is team two? And the Christmas thing. Okay, so Callie, you, you'll join them. We'll, we'll touch base just enough for you to get patched together on what the project is. And then you weren't yeah. here either, you would be on team three. Okay. Who's on team three? So you're with Eric's group. Okay. And, and probably others that aren't here tonight. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we are going to review a little bit and we are going to get caught up to, uh, we, we're going to, we're going to get from that slide to this slide, where we're going to start uh, the project activity planning uh, conversation again, and that's the network diagramming that we're working on. And then we're going to get from that, uh, that slide to uh, a slide a little ways down on, on costing, because that's the next big thing that we have to look at, is what is our project going to cost? So cost uh, management is to that slide. So I don't know if we'll get all the way there, that's slide 39. Uh, we, we should get most of the way there because I'm gonna go pretty fast on a lot of this stuff because it is review. Then we have an exercise, we have a few exercises that we're gonna do uh, as uh, groups today also. At least we'll start on them. And then we are going to look into how do we bend the schedule? What do we do to crash the schedule is the term we use in project management. We, we saw it just a little bit in one of the videos that we ended class with on Tuesday. And we're gonna pick up on that again and look at it a little bit more. Uh, and we're gonna look at it with an example of uh, a, a diagramming example as we go through it. It's a little bit longer video, but it's thorough. And I think that we need to have it. When we're, when we're looking at network diagramming, this is one of the tangible things that proves to the people around you that you're a project manager. Most of project manager's skills are invisible. You know, like leadership is kind of an invisible skill. You don't know until you see a bad leader and go, wow, that's a bad leader. You know, you can't tell by looking at first. Uh, and the same thing is true with project managers. Somebody says they're a project manager, you have to take them at their word and hope they can deliver. And then if you realize that they can't, you realize they've overspoken on their skill sets. But if somebody is putting together project planning maps that have work breakdown structures in them and have Gantt charts and network diagramming, whether you're using uh, activity on arrow or activity on node uh, diagramming as your PERT uh, diagram, it doesn't matter. It sends a message that they know something I don't know. In all probability, most people won't have, they'll see gap charts before, but the other things they won't be as familiar with. And so as you demonstrate that to them, they will take their hat off a little bit quicker to your credential. They'll acknowledge that you have uh, some skills that you have under your belt in how to manage a project, which is what you've been telling them, except it's just not very visible. So this work breakdown structure and network diagramming that we're working on right now, that's the first document that you can pass by your boss and say, here's the project we're working on right now, we're getting ready to kick it off, preliminary planning we haven't done as a team yet, I want you to be glued in on what, we're, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, and how I want to lead the team. Now they may end up in a different place because it's team activity, but I'm the project manager and this is the guidance that I'm going to start the project off recommending and the boss looks at your map and goes, oh, we're in good hands. Uh, and they will sweat a little bit less about what you're doing because you've showed them at the very beginning of the project that 
that you have intentions of controlling the project and bringing it in on time on budget uh, with the quality expectations that they have. So if you can put your boss's mind at ease early, they will tend to micromanage you less. And if you're like me, you hate micromanaging. I don't like my boss sticking his nose in the stuff that he's given me to do. If he's gonna do it, just do it. Let me do something else and, and uh, leave me alone. And that makes me maybe not a great employee, but, but I feel like I can contribute and so the boss doesn't need to do it for me. And if they want to, don't pay me, just do it. And, and so in project management, I'd like them to have the comfort that I'm in fact gonna take it to where they want it taken. And they can, they can, that's one thing they can cross off their worry list. They don't have to sweat it. Because if I got a problem or get a problem, I'll go to them then and we'll discuss that. But I'll try to solve it before we get to that point. So network diagramming is real important. Um, so just kind of reviewing some of the stuff um, that's, that's in, in, in important. Uh, we, we like to establish project could be formal, could be informal. It could be a, it could be at the park, it could be uh, at a restaurant, it could be at Starbucks. A lot of meetings happen at Starbucks that push pro projects forward, especially when they involve uh, people from, you know, subcontractors and, and, and vendors and things like that. You don't have to meet uh, at your business unless that's the culture for your business. And so the project management can occur in all kinds of environments, just like learning can. Uh, that we talk about. So, uh, do what rules do we want to have during our project management stuff? Do we want people to be interrupted, or do we not want them to be interrupted? What are the rules of engagement that we would have in our our project? Uh, we we understand in project management the same as we are here in training. I've used this slides uh, a number of times, but it's probably worth uh, reviewing. When we have a lecture, which is what you're having right now, student retention is somewhere about none. <laughs> we just don't remember what we hear. You know, that's why we have to keep going to church every week. We get hoping that our retention gets a little higher, you know? And, and, and so uh, when we read something, we magically remember double what we, we heard in the lecture hall, which is still pretty crappy. We forget 90% of what we read. We remember about 10% of what we read, and if we don't put it back together in order, we screw it up anyway. So if we get a chance to look at a visual, like a PowerPoint, uh, or, or some sort of soundtrack, or, or video even better, uh, we remember more. That's why YouTube is so successful. We, we get YouTube in small clips often, and there's YouTube clips up for everything. And, and, you know, if you're putting on an obscure uh, generator on an old 1950 Jaguar, there's probably a YouTube video on how to do it. And you go, how, you know, uh, who's posting all this stuff up there? But we've got millions of people in the world that are sharing their learning. Our way of learning is changing. Uh, and, and we have learned that watching those little video clips, many people would prefer to start with that, even if they're watching somebody do it wrong. They prefer to start with that, watching the video clip, because it's faster and easier and we remember more of it. If we can actually watch somebody do it, we remember another 50%. So we're up to about a 30% retention of what the training is if we watch somebody do it. Uh, that clarifies a lot of things for us. We go, okay, we, we, get, we get a gauge on how fast they do it. We get a gauge on when they're really paying attention and when they're not so much. You know, if you're learning how to play guitar and, and you watch a, you know, the guitarist from Black Sabbath or some, somebody that's been doing it for 40 years on stage and reached a, a pinnacle of expertise, they can do a whole lot of stuff while they're cutting an unbelievable riff. Why? Because they, 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 they breathe it. And so watching a demonstration of somebody doing it that is at that, at the highest level, I'm not saying that he's the highest level, but got to be up there in, in my book. And, and, and watching those types of demonstrations, we really learn. And it may be we just learn one little thing about how they kick a fret or, or do one little thing that helps us elevate our skill set. And so we, we see that in the demonstration 
we wouldn't have ever heard about that in this stupid lecture on, on how to play lead guitar. You know, you would have missed that altogether. Uh, if we have a chance for people that know how to do it to discuss it, we remember more of that discussion. Because now we're, in, in, we're engaged in it, we're able to ask questions, and we're able to, because uh, to, my gaps are different than your gaps. And you may get more of it, and I'm, I missed some things. And, and I ask one or two questions in discussion, and all of a sudden, you ever, you've been confused, 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 and all of a sudden you ask one question and the light bulb goes on. Everything falls into place. You felt like you didn't know any of it, but all of a sudden it just all got clear. Uh, that happened because of discussion. It happened because you got to ask a question that clarified your barrier, whatever it was. And, and we all have barriers, we all have different ones. If we get a chance to get hands on and do it, we start remembering three out of four things that we were learning. Memory goes way up, our retention goes way up. And that's why we are drawing uh, AOA diagrams. It's so we're doing it. And we're going to do another one today because this is, this is one of the things. How do, we, how do we get a table of activity precedence and then how do we map that so that the boss thinks we know what we're doing? And I want you to do that enough until you really can, can, can explain it that way. And I, I want you to not get stuck at that point. If you can get to the point where you're teaching somebody else how to do it, that is when you really learn. We all really learn. Uh, as we teach something, we have to master the topic to a level beyond uh, what we ha had before. And one of the things that we're working on, a, on an apprenticeship program right now for automation for uh, technicians at, uh, at the ice cream plant and at uh, Lighthouse Foods, I was there yesterday talking to him about it. And, and one of the things we want to do with these automation students is get them out, you know, they go through all this stuff, get to the point where they're actually doing it, programming a variable frequency drive or whatever they're doing in a control system. But we actually want to get them to the point where they're creating uh, video documents, they're creating the YouTube videos, they're creating the teaching materials, they're teaching others, the next people that the company will hire, they're, they're creating video clips for those people to learn because now if my students are doing the teaching, uh, they'll probably be past me real quickly because they already have more, more uh, general knowledge than I do and, and uh, they're coming to it with all this world experience of doing what they're doing and if they can get to the point where they start to teach it, uh, we know we have mastery and the program is tied, it's a journeyman program. If you, if you are a master electrician, that's a journeyman. It's been eight years in the field doing electrical work. If that person has never taught anybody, you don't know for sure that they're really at a master electrician competency or if they just went to work and clocked in every day and really didn't keep learning. You know, you, we've worked with some of those people. But others, uh, they're genius. <laughs> you know, they, they are beyond, the word master isn't enough. They are beyond master uh, electricians. They are consummate technicians that, that know. And those are the people I want on my team. And those are the people who can teach it. Those are the people that can, can do it. And so that's our, our retention model uh, that we look at. And, uh, and so we've tried to build uh, our, our learning uh, based on that. And as we have team members, we want to teach the same concept in our project management. The people that are on our project team, uh, we, we need them to learn. We need them to contribute. We need them to be involved. We need them to be players. And somehow, the same expectations are on our team members as they are when we go to a class. I can't teach anybody anything. You learn because you choose to learn. And that's a choice. And we've all sat in the back of classrooms and shut down while somebody ran their mouth. And then we chose to learn when we wanted to. And we probably, YouTube didn't have that, right? We probably looked it up when we needed to. And that's, that's a waste of your time, their time. Uh, and so if we've got those people on our team, that's a problem. Uh, the only barrier to learning the truth is assume you already know it. We want to start projects out with that understanding. We've got experts in the room, but our pooled knowledge, we hope, is better than any one of our individual knowledges. And our team is working on a project to bring it in a, at a level that is better than any one of us could have done individually. That's why we're a team. That's why we're doing a project as a team. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm drawing uh, experts into the, into the, onto the team 
so that we can really be good. If everybody on uh, the, the Raiders had the same skill sets, the Raiders would be an even worse team, right, than, than, than they are now. I'm not saying they're a bad team. I'm just saying we'll have to see how they, how they win, the, if they can win their, uh, their uh, division or not. So we talked about why we do project management. And we talked about the definition. It's temporary. Uh, it's not something that we're doing over and over again. Uh, we, we drew the differences between our operations as a company, uh, the similarities, we've got people doing it, it's, we've got limited resources, uh, we, we have to plan what we're doing, whether it's the factory floor or whether it's a, a one-time project. The differences are uh, that in the project, nobody's maybe been down the road with that project before. First time we're doing that project. It's not a normal thing. It's a one-time thing. And it's, it's, the, it's the first one we made. And that becomes a project. And sometimes those projects have to be handled on the factory floor, but in a project management setting. I'll give you an example. Uh, we all know Adonia Yachts down here on River uh, Road. Uh, if, you, if you don't, uh, look them up sometime. Uh, Adonia sells all those big, big houseboats on Lake Powell. And the ones that, uh, that you'd all love to have a ride on. I'd love to, I'd love to live on one, I think. Uh, and and uh, those, those yachts uh, sell up to $20 million, I think, is the most expensive one they've sold. Their normal ones aren't quite that high. Uh, they're four, five, six million uh, dollars for their normal yacht. They all have a helicopter pad on the top of them. Uh, they all are being sold to people that got enough money to want something cool. And this isn't where they live. This is where they, they spend two weeks a year on vacation, you know. This, these, these aren't their, their they, have, they have nice houses and stuff too. And one of the guys that when they were building a yacht for, for uh, Dave is the, the owner of uh, Adonia Yachts, and, and he gets to talk to most of these people because they're big money people and they don't want to talk to salesmen. They want to talk to the owner while the owner uh, writes down the criteria for what they want on their custom-built yacht. Like, how many bedrooms do you need? Uh, or, no, how many do you want? Not how many you need, how many do you want? What do you want the kitchen to look like? Uh, you want one on each floor? There's three floors on most of them. Yeah, they probably do. And so they talk about control systems, and they talk about automatic docking and automatic piloting, and fish finders everywhere, all this stuff. And, and this guy said, I want jet skis, of course, on the back. I want to be able to haul more jet skis than most people do, because I seem to have more jet skis than most people do. But I don't want you to see it. And everybody's got these rows and these racks with jet skis. And he goes, I want a garage for my jet skis on the yacht. And they got a swim deck on the back of them that's, you know, you could have a party on. And, and they got this giant swim deck on the back. He's going, what if we made that swim deck deep, you know, like as deep as the rest of the hall, and what if we opened it up and it became a water garage? I could just drive jet skis in there and then close down, you wouldn't see it. They go, that'd be cool, but we've never done that before. In fact, we've never seen anybody done that before. And then he, the guy, of course, by the time he describes it, what does he want? Well, it's a garage for his jet skis, you know? And he's sold on that, that's what he wants. They haven't told him how much it will cost because they have no idea. That is a project. It may later become a product line. They may make yachts regularly. Everybody may get a garage for your jet skis on, on your yacht. I don't know. Uh, I have seen garages on the Mediterranean yachts on the side of the yacht that open up and you can drive a boat into it and park your boat inside your yacht. Uh, those are like ski boats and those kinds of boats. This is just jet skis, so it's small scale compared to that, right? So the guys at Adonia sit down and they form a project team. Now this project team is going to have to figure out on paper, can they do this? Can they make it work? And then they're, they're not going to have a chance to truly prototype this. They're not going to build one and put it on a yacht and then see if the guy wants to buy it. He's already committed to buying it. They've already committed to selling it. They just don't know if they can do it and how much it will cost. So this project starts to run in parallel with their factory floor. Everything else on that yacht is going to be normal production, quote unquote, maybe custom and dimensions and stuff, but it's things they know how to do and they're already doing it that will be done uh, in, as, in a normal production line. 
But into that production line will be inserted a project team that's working on a project of how can we make a garage for jet skis in the water. And, and the answer, that fast forward, the answer is yeah, they could, they did, it's out there. Uh, in, you know, the guy's probably tired of it now, he's probably ready to sell the yacht, I don't know uh, about that. Uh, attention spans are really short among the super rich people. They always want one faster jet than the one they already have. Uh, so I don't know how that will wind up. But when we're looking at projects and operations, often they get blurred as for what is a project, what is an operation. And it's important for us as a company to continue to define that. Had they put this on the production manager at Adonia Yacht, that guy would have had a problem. Tyler's his name. And he would have had a problem trying to manage something he doesn't know how to, doesn't know what it is at all. They needed to assign a project manager to that and let the production people not even think about it or worry about it, right? Let the design engineers draw it up. Um, they did scale it to try to see if it would work in small scale. It turned out it did, and so then they scaled it back up. And then at that point where they were ready to manufacture, they inserted a special team that understood what was going on for those moving parts as they built it. So that's kind of how we would look at projects. Sometimes the plant manager or the production manager needs to have the culture to stay out of the way of the project manager while they come up with their project. Uh, and, and they hatch it, even though it's going to wind up in a production part or production device, in this case, a boat that they make uh, all the time. Uh, we've talked about this one, what all it is, uh, the objectives of our project, all that stuff. Uh, it involves all kinds of, of things, but in the, in the end, we have a teeter-totter between cost and quality and time and scope. Uh, the tendency on scope is that we get in trouble and we want to shrink the scope, and the customer gets excited and they want to expand the scope. Or uh, worse yet, we have that contention from within the organization. If it's a, a project development, we're trying to see if we can do something, the sales team gets a sniff that maybe we're working on this to check out the feasibility, and they start selling. Well, it's not a product yet, it's a project. And, and so the tension of scope expansion is with, from within our own, we become our own enemy. Our sales team promises something that we are not even sure we can do. We're figuring out how to do it. We're, we are uh, working, we don't know the cost. We're working feasibility, all that stuff. So the, the strain on holding the scope of the project is within our own organization. So we have to talk about that. If we, if we want to be mature as a company, we have to talk about that before it's a problem. Because as soon as it's a problem, We've got people emotionally invested in it, and there'll become an argument to fight, and somebody will get fired. And that's unnecessary if we manage it uh, before it happens, and we say, look, this is the probability. We will have, uh, I will want to shrink the scope because it's hard to do all the stuff that you want. You want all these features in this, in this little clicker. And I want a laser pointer on it. And but that's a whole different thing, right? And, 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 and so, that's scope creep. If all of a sudden you're ready to deliver this thing, and instead of me saying I just want it red, because you can anodize that in any color, right? And that, you know, that's not a big deal. But if I say I've got to have a laser pointer on it, all of a sudden it's a different project. And, this, and, and the boss goes, sure, I've seen one of the laser pointer. That's got to be no problem, right? And then I say, well, I want a green one because it shows up better in the daytime. They say, I don't know, that's on gun lasers anyway. They say you can see a target with the green laser better in the daytime than you can at night. And if I thought that was really true, I think stoplights would be green. But that's just me. I'm not sure about whether green lasers are more visible than red lasers or not. Look it up. The guys say that the green ones are. Uh, and so I want a green one in here, and that becomes a whole different thing because green lasers are about double the price of a red laser. And they're generated <coughs> the same kind of way, but through a different crystal. And, and so, so that project creep just got bigger, my, my scope got bigger, so my time, I'm gonna be late, my cost is gonna go high, and I might have to cut a corner and just buy a laser from Alibaba to put it on here, right? And therefore, it might not be what we want, because, so the project manager 
is constantly balancing these four factors. And we've talked about that before. This is a review. Uh, we're still going to be talking about We put one more in there that wasn't on the last slide. Uh, we put risk on there because we are not able to get away from risk. And risk is, we shouldn't get away from risk. Risk to the project, risk to the company, risk to the customer, risk, risk to the patient. So you're making a medical device or a pharmaceutical product. We can't get away from risk. And, and so if our project is related uh, to something that we've never done before, we don't have a good handle on risk. Let me give you an example of where that's a problem. Uh, we have uh, big companies in town that build stuff. Uh, Sunrock being an example of one, but we've got a number of competitors of Sunrock that are in town, and they build stuff. A lot of time the job they get is not in St. George. They're going to build a bridge over I-15 over, maybe it's close, maybe it's in the gorge. Uh, maybe it's a Virgin River bridge that they're going to rebuild. And they get the contract on that. So they got to go down there to do the job. So what they often typically do is they, they put a temporary ba concrete batch plant near the location where they're going to do all this concrete bridge work. Uh, if they're going to asphalt, they'll put a, put a hot plant down there, temporary, of when it comes time to do all this paving work in that area. So they're not trucking materials from St. George or who knows farther. A lot of these jobs are 100, 200 miles from where the plants are at. So you need a portable plant that will go set up in the area where the job is at. And it's on that task. They know, they, they know how to build a portable plant. They have stuff on wheels that they can port uh, and move around. But when we look at the, uh, uh, the EMOD for their workers' comp insurance, we find out that these companies have far more accidents in the act of doing a temporary project. Why is that? It's because they got a crew of people that are going to go put a hot plant down at Cedar Breaks exit, and all the kids on that project, and one old guy, the kids have never done it before, and the old guy has and forgot how they did it because they got a new gizmo since last time they did it. They did that last time five years ago. I'm making that all up. That's that, I'm just making that up. But it's not something they do day to day. It's a special project. The idea of a portable batch plant is not a new idea. But a portable batch plant in that location, you've got to map egress, entrance, the traffic patterns, the materials patterns coming in, how you're going to get finished product going out. Where's the water going to come from? You know, are the, are the environmentalists going to let you pull it out of the river? Probably not. You're going to have to haul water. How are you going to take it? Where are you going to store it? That has not been done at that location ever before. So if you want water pressure, you're going to put the tank up the hillside. So you've got water pressure going into your production plant and instead of pumping pressure. And so these are the kinds of consideration the team <coughs> will have to map out and put together. It's a one-time project in essence. Even though they've, they've run into that kind of thing before, this project is a one-time project. And because they don't have it well mapped out and memorized how they're going to do it, they're flying by the seat of their pants doing the best they can to be slow and careful and good while the production foreman and the owner are saying faster, faster, faster. And so we make a mistake in the assembly of this temporary plant and a guy puts a part on it before the structure is fully supported and it falls over. And it hurts somebody when it falls over. And, and so we now have injuries occurring because, and that goes right to the project manager. The project manager can't let stuff like that go until they are sure that they have the plans in place to meet the safety criteria, the uniqueness of this task, because it's not what we do. They make sand and gravel. I mean, no. They make concrete. They make sand and gravel. Sand's made by something higher than them. Uh, the, the sand is used, in, and they make concrete. They don't make batch plants. That's not what they sell. They sell concrete. So the means to produce this is a temporary project, and managing that project has a huge amount of risk with it, the risk of people getting hurt. And that goes to the project manager to have conversations. Uh, many times we have outside 
uh, consultants that help us with that kind of thing. And Workers' Comp of Utah is one of them. They are an insurance company that hires engineers. Did you know that? They've got an engineer that's assigned Southern Utah here, and that engineer will help you be safe. Because if you're not safe, they pay. I mean, you pay too, but they pay. It's, it, it's in their best interest for you to not have accidents. And so they put engineers on their staff to look at your projects to help you in risk assessment. And most of that they do for free because they charge you an arm and a leg for workers' comp insurance. What's, what's an example of a company, make up a company, how many employees, and what would a typical cost monthly be of a workers' comp? $25,000 a month for workers' comp. That's a big number. That's why it's not fair to hire a contractor that doesn't have insurance because they don't have that expense. So they've got a comp an unfair advantage in competing against you, right? But usually they come out about your price and that other that they saved is just profit until they have an accident and then there's, you know, who knows what happens. But the risk management is something that uh, that $25,000 bill for workers' comp insurance is part of the way we manage risk. We spread it out to ensure it's an insurable item for insurable events, and we try to manage risk through products like that. But anyway, uh, risk is uh, one of the things we have to incur. incur. Uh, for effective response to rapid changes, grasp that in your mind for a second. What we are facing in most businesses are rapid changes. Even industries that are as old as Vanderbilt building a bridge across the Hudson River, uh, the steel and the fabrication business in the United States is not new. Uh, it's been, you know, structural steel's been around for a long time. I mean, we've, 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 we had the French putting an Eiffel Tower together out of iron, right? Ship it to the United States and, and uh, uh, a bottle of it from which we said, yeah, that's cool. So they built us a Statue of Liberty, all right? That's a, that's a, that's a project. They built two of them. One's in the Seine River and one's in our New York Harbor, right? And most of you have seen that. And, and that's a project that had never been done before uh, when they gave, they gave up serial number one to us. They liked it so well, the serial number two is back in France. And, and so, so the idea of responding to a, 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 you know, a, an impulse buy kind of thing, we have a lot of business owners that have an impulse change. Our industry changes. So even though the structural steel industry seems like it's the same as it's always been, you've got CNC punches and, and all kinds of stuff that's run with space age technology now. And as a result, uh, the business is different. And so responding to those kinds of changes is something that we uh, are uh, involved in and drug into as project managers. We talked about the project lifestyle and I had a life cycle. And I had a nice little curve drawn on the, on the whiteboard. And, and then uh, it's necessary to go back and say, no two curves of a project life cycle are the same. Uh, the, all projects are unique and they're their own thing. And, and so there's not a set model that the project life cycle has to uh, follow. It just has a model where our cost and staffing level starts out pretty low. Our cost is low and few people on the job. As the job gets uh, traction, we hire more people to do the project and our cost gets higher and higher. And then as we close the project down, most of the trades are done and the people are starting to filter away from the project, and yet the project's still not done. But if you count the trucks uh, on the job site, they become fewer as we are looking at the final sign-offs and the final inspections and things like that. The work itself is often essentially done. So every uh, project has its own life cycle. The interesting thing about cost is that as we get more and more invested in the project, it becomes more and more difficult to change. And yet that's when the changes most often uh, occur. We, you, people see it and they go, wow, I just saw the drawings. I didn't realize it was that big or that small or what, whichever, whatever it is. And so they're, they're going, can we, whatever, blow a wall out 
out and move it out of four feet. Well, sure you can. But it's not free. We've got to tear it down. And those materials aren't going to be reused. And so it's, the change is, is possible, but we are so invested that it's going to cost more and more to make those changes. And at the same time, the stakeholders become less able to dictate to us what we're going to do. So our, our project management uh, hat becomes different. When the project is brand new, and kicking off the stakeholders are calling all the shots, including the threat that if this doesn't line up the way we want it, I'll cancel the project. And they'll pull a plug on it, and when they pull a plug on it, everybody scatters with their hair on fire and goes, holy cow, that was my job for the next six months. Now what happens? And maybe I don't have a job. Maybe we don't have a replacement job in place when that project uh, gets, gets canned, gets trashed. So we're very, very... Uh, respectful of stakeholders in the very early stages of, of the project because of the threat of them being able to, uh, to terminate the project. Also, they're the ones that can, can expand the project uh, more easily before we broke the ground or before we launched uh, all the effort. And so we pay a lot of attention to them. Uh, we have to throughout, but understand that their influence gets less and less as the project moves on. They've already paid their money. We've already got their money. We've already got their commitment. They are in too far to pull out. And, and so the influence, whether they like it or not, their influence weakens as the project moves on. And that means it didn't go away. Influence changed. Where is the influence? Where does it go? The influence often shifts to the owner of the project. And sometimes they are the stakeholders. But, but, but not always. Uh, in fact, many times the money comes from somewhere else. And so as, as that influence dwindles, power gains somewhere else. And in most cases, where that gain is at is at the project management level. You, as a project manager, gain more power. Now, you can't spend it, per se. You have to be a steward of your power. And it's not something that you keep forever. You keep for the duration of the project until it, until it looks like the project's going to be late and over budget, in which case you don't want anything to do with it at that point. And your power goes, goes away and you're on the hot seat at that point in time. But there's a period here where the power is really held by the project manager. And you need to understand that. Power is a very, very interesting thing. I have a book at, uh, in my library. It's a thick book and it's... Uh, uh, it's been in the literature for 60 or 70 years at this point. It's not a new book. And it's called 48 Laws of Power. And if you ever get it, run across a copy of that at the DI or some sort, buy it and then, you know, look at it from time to time. You know, it's too big to read cover to cover for me. My attention span isn't long enough for that. But I, I have read it cover to cover. And, and the power is an incredibly elusive thing. We spend a lot of our life uh, trying to understand power, trying to know uh, it's an interesting thing. Power, if you think you have it, you have it. If you think you don't have it, you don't have it, even if you do have it. If you think you don't, you don't. And it's a very interesting thing. The people that, that think they don't have power don't have uh, the people that think they do pow have power have a certain amount of power just because they think they got it, whether they really have it or not. And and power is a a a par uh, it's a it's a uh, a paradox. Uh, it's a dichotomy of terms. Power uh, is, is even goes back to Bible principles. Those of you that study that, um, you know the the couple of the characters in the, the, the Bible were arguing over who was going to be the most powerful in, in, in heaven, and who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand, if you want the story. And, and, and there was an argument over that, and, and the, the paradox of power is that if you want power, you serve other people. And so power is the thing you have to give it away to get more. And, and that is a principle that most of the people around us don't ever understand in their whole life. And it's something, as a project manager, if you could get a grip of that, uh, uh, it's not just a spiritual principle. It is a spiritual principle. In every religion that I've looked at, uh, power is a factor in there. We want to understand power. 
But the principle of if you want power, you, you serve other people. And the more power you give away, the more power you ultimately have. And that is true in project management. So at this spot right here, you have the most power you will have in the project. And that needs to be spent wisely. If you give it away, you will, you will retain more than if you, if you try to hoard it. If you try to hoard power, the chances are that the people that are making this project come in on time, on budget, uh, will, will not like you hoarding power and hoarding power over them. And so uh, that will backfire often on us if we do that at that point. Um, we've talked about the phases. We prepare. We plan. That's half of the thing before we even start the project. And, and that is hard for people to want to do because we're all going home. We want to start. We're going to break ground. When are we going to break ground? And, and we see projects in town. We'll see a sign pop up that says, future home up. And you go, oh, that's cool. And you keep driving by, and it just says, future home up. And eventually, the sign gets blown over, and you go, what happened? And on occasion, the projects fall apart. But most often, the project still gets built there or done there, but it just takes a long time before they break ground. They knew they were going to when they bought the land. Uh, but they have all kinds of, of tight ropes to walk to get the project off the ground. And that's the preparing and planning stages. And the planning stages often uh, require other parties. And those other parties in the planning stage uh, can kill the project. Some of you remember when they rerouted uh, Middleton Drive by exit 13 between that and St. George Boulevard on the, that side of the freeway um, by your old bike shop that, uh, that was there. They, uh, that, that was rerouted uh, so we could put a water slide, water park up on the hill there. That's Remember that? I was gonna say, oh my God, that's been coming for 10 years. It ain't coming anymore. It's done. Uh, and and that, that was done because we couldn't get the county commissioners to sign off on the water usage in the end. And, and the project has six other successful projects in other parts of the United States. They know what water consumptions are. Uh, they are not what this Washington County feared and what ultimately killed the project. But that was an example where we saw parts laying there. We saw water slide tubes laying on that ground and they, they, they cleared out the ground. The trailer park that was there is gone. They reroute the street to make parking for the water park and it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna have a water park in St. George. And uh, we couldn't get it out of the planning process. It, all the money was there. All of the investor support was there. In the end, all of the parts to build it were there. We couldn't get an approval from, we, I had nothing to do. We couldn't get an approval uh, from the county in the end. They had given preliminary approvals, and then there, was, there were two elections that drug out so long. There were two elections, uh, two year apart, uh, that both brought different uh, contention into the project. So the project looked like it was gonna go. Uh, it had verbal approval from people that, were gonna, that needed to support it politically. And in the end, it didn't happen. And, and so I can't say that's the fault of the project manager. But I can say there wasn't clarity about who the project manager was. And the owners lived out of state. And the thing got away from them, at least in part, because they didn't have a local friend. Because uh, business does happen a lot of times with the good old boy network, right? Uh, you don't like it, but it does happen that way. And we only had three county commissioners. How many did you need to win? Two people. That's all you needed to win. Two people. Uh, I got to believe that could have been done. They're, they're level-headed, reasonable men. Maybe that's a problem. But anyway, um, uh, it didn't happen because of that. So we see projects that often don't get to the executing stage at all. And, and our job, if we are the project manager, is to make sure that it does. And if we see a project forming and it does not have strong management uh, skill sets involved, throw your hat in the ring. If it's your boss, go to your boss and say, this thing isn't going to happen magically. You need to have and pay for a project manager to get it from here to here. And that's what you've got the skills to do. 
So whether your company is used to using project managers and if they want to use another label, that's fine. Uh, use another title. Uh, it doesn't matter what the title is. It matters what the task is. And as a project manager, that's our task. All right. We are going to work on a project chart. And I'm not sure that that job actually got sent to the printer. So I may, I may catch back up with you. Uh, I want a project charter on your Christmas party project. A project charter is a starting point to get everybody that's on the team. Uh, it's a contract, really, of sorts. It's not ever, um, not a, I shouldn't say not ever. It's not usually written as a contract. It's written as a one-page cheat sheet. It's just, it's just documenting uh, what you're doing. And, and I always have a boss sign off on it so that as you're wandering your way down the project, they don't change your mind on what they authorized you to do. Uh, I have seen a lot of bosses think they said one thing and we all heard a different thing. And halfway through, they go, no, that's not what I said. Well, let's go back to the project charter. Let's look what we all agreed to. And if we've covered all of our our bases in the project charter, then it will save an argument down the road when somebody says, well, well, I, I didn't mean that. Well, okay, but man up. That's what you said, and that's what our project charter agreed to. And it gives us a leg to stand on in terms of just keeping harmony uh, in, in the organization. And the, the more involved and the more outside people we have, the more important the project charter is. Uh, first of all, it's it's my it's my marching papers. It's my, it's my if I'm the project manager, this tells me that I have the support to do the project. Uh, we want the project manager named, and we want uh, uh, when we're doing a project in the medical arena. Just to give you an, an example, I'm working. We talked before class about uh, uh, some work I'm helping a company with right now, and that the first thing on a project for. Uh, the United States anyway, uh, when we are going to introduce a medical device or a new drug, uh, we have to name the project manager to the United States Food and Drug Administration. We have to say whose name is on the line, not the owner of the company, not the person with the money, the project manager is named to the FDA. And so all correspondence on the project goes through the FDA uh, and it goes through that person. And, and so it, it's that important to our governmental process of approving drugs and medical devices in the United States. Any company that has a, a needle or a liquid or a, a device of any kind, whether it's cheap or uh, millions of dollars, has a project manager on that device before that device can go to market. And that project manager is the, who the FDA communicates with. So, so we want to do that same model for our little tiny projects if the FDA's not involved. Just a little project, just with ten people at, comp at the company. So, so that we've named the person, that we we can't get halfway through the pro project and somebody else's name goes on there, and we throw them under the bus. We we own the project, and that's the right way to to structure uh, the project. There does need to be uh, somebody outside the project. Everybody in the project can't be in the project. We kind of need we kind of need some rational. Uh, 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 balance to the project. Often the funding is just because that's the way business works. Most of the time, businesses don't capitalize things with their own money. Even companies that have money borrow it. Uh, and that's how business works. We will be talking about that next semester. I hope some of you probably saw that Elon sold $8 billion worth of Tesla stock. I'm not sure that that was meant. It's $3.8 but whatever it was, it was with a B. And that was to fund something else that he's working on. I hope it's not Twitter, but it's something else that he's working on. And that, that you know, Tesla stock dropped to $121 because and, and he did that. It's like, what, is he quitting Tesla? Or what's going on? That just happened this week. And, you know, I don't know how it's going to pan out. It'll, you know, we always overreact and we'll come back to normal. And he's going, no, it's not that. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. And, and uh, I'm not sure <laughs> what happened. I think he got believing that Joe Biden was going to go to Bitcoin and get rid of money. So I don't, I don't know. There's some talk about that as well. So the 
the money in the project uh, is always something that is, is our, our people, our stakeholders that we care about. A small business here in town, you know, Brennan's starting up a distribution network that's going to be Rocky Mountain area or something, uh, resort related things is kind of what one of your ideas is. Uh, the chances are good he'll put a plan together and even if he's got the cash to do it, he might use the cash for operations and he might get, put, get an SBA loan, you know, small business administration loan. Uh, they're hard to qualify for, but if you qualify for it, it's good interest rates and you get good cash uh, from a, backed by the federal government, but get cash from the local bank. We'll talk about how SBA loans work for those of you that are interested in that in the next module uh, a little bit. But one of the things that happens when we get an SBA loan is all the projects that we've got going that are using any of that capital, we got Zion Bank looking over the shoulder and going, what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, let's see, what, what, are, what are you, they, they, have, they, they loan the money with some, something that they call covenants. And covenants are, are promises. You know, the, the Bible is the new covenant and that's what Zion Bank thinks their, their loan, uh, their, their lending covenants are. They can shut you down if you're out of compliance with the covenant. And a lot of co times the covenants have to do with how much inventory you have on hand, which is their way of, of, of getting their money back if you go broke in a bankruptcy auction. Uh, they've got that, that leaned, and so you know, they want you to ha have enough inventory to bail them out if you shut the door, uh, but maybe you know, you're lean and you don't want a lot of inventory. So you got the bank telling you you gotta have it. And one of the, one of the covenants that's often in, in SBA lending is your milestones on your project. Because you're, you're a lot of times taking money to, take, to make something from nothing, and it's, it's needed that you get to those end stages, those end milestones, for their investment to be back. Let's say you're just building a house. You're, you're a custom home builder. And those bank covenants on, the, on, the, on the, the, the construction loans that you have while you're building, they've got milestones, and if you miss those milestones, they may shut the project down because they're scared that you're not, you didn't pour concrete when you said you're going to pour concrete. So they have less to sell if you go toes up. And, and so running the phases of your project uh, is going to depend on the lenders a lot of times. Uh, also uh, looking over our back and out over our shoulder and trying to keep us on track. All right, so uh, the project charter needs to address the following things. And it's a long list in a checklist, but let's read through it. Uh, I'm trying to do this quick enough that we can, we can move to some other stuff. The charter should have the requirements of everybody that's a stakeholder in the project. It should talk about our business case, why we are doing the project from a justification point, strategically what is it doing for us? Why are we doing this project? It needs to include uh, the organization structure, the project manager, and the team, uh, whoever they might be, what it is that you're going to deliver, what the milestones are, uh, who the stakeholders are in terms of, of what purse strings do they control and how do they control. And, and so you can they back out, can they not back out as a contractual commitment. Uh, those things need to be in the project charter. Uh, what the functional organization is, uh, that's around the project. So this is how it can get derailed a lot of times. So we, we name it and describe it. Uh, what the uh, constraints, assumptions uh, that we are seeing, the external factors like the county commission has to sign off on this water park before we can really actually build it, even though we got all the rest of the ducks in a row. Uh, that's normally put in the charter. And uh, what impact changes have on the project itself. So you generally project charters say that if there's a significant change, we reset the project charter. What that means is we reevaluate. Are we still funded okay? Uh, are we still, are our, our milestones still in the right place? Because we had a change. And this change has a domino effect on the whole project and how is it impacting that? That needs to be discussed in the uh, project chart. Well planned, almost done. Actually, it's one of our, of our, uh, our, our many uh, steps that we have to do, but project activity planning, this is kind of how it goes when you don't have a good project plan. Columbus left Spain, but he didn't know where he's going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. When he got back, he didn't know where he'd been. And he did that 
three more times. <laughs> it worked out okay for Columbus. He's got a holiday named after him. But we probably won't uh, if we do our projects that way. Uh, that was a little lucky on his part. Uh, he got out of the house for a long time and uh, discovered some interesting stuff. But that's a project that is not normal, right? Normal project isn't going to have, uh, there were a lot of explorers that didn't go back, get back home. Uh, there are a lot of explorers with no plan about where they were going to go to some place they didn't know, and it was uh, uh, a problem. Planning is not an activity that's done in the beginning. Planning is a process that never stops as we are going through. We are planning the scope, we're planning the activities, we're planning the way the activities link together, we're planning what it's going to cost, and we're planning where we could get hurt, uh, what the risks are associated with it. So those are all of the things that we have to plan. We have to plan them separate. The project scope has a scope statement that we need to make sure we write. It's a written scope statement. Should address uh, the objectives, uh, the requirements and characteristics, acceptance criteria uh, that says we did a good job. What is, what, how are you going to sign off on this? Um, what is included, what isn't included, uh, what the requirements are, what we are going to deliver, what constraints we have, what assumptions we're making, uh, how the project initially is going to kick off and what we organize, what risks we know about, what the schedule milestones are, and what the map looks like, the work breakdown structure. We will need a work breakdown structure for your Christmas party. So we'll, we'll need a, a, uh, uh, a project uh, uh, covenant, if you want to call it that, a, that, that, you, that you draw a charter and, uh, and a scope uh, statement for your Christmas party. And the scope statement is not a 10-page document. It's not drawn up by a lawyer. The scope statement's a one-pager with bullet points. Uh, it may be a one-paragraph, depending on the, on the scope. It doesn't have to be uh, all that. Uh, the, the steps we're going to take, and this takes us to kind of where we are, I'm going to the beginning just to show this is the sequence. This isn't the finish. That gets us to where we are right now, almost halfway through this, uh, this class. We're about halfway through the process that we need to do. Uh, so we've got the work breakdown structure. We are going to take from the work breakdown structure and develop an activity table. That's what we started with. These are the activities that need to happen. These are the duration that we're estimating for these activities and put all the durations in the same units of time, minutes, hours, weeks, years, whatever it is. And then we are going to describe the dependency or the precedence for each activity. So can we, if we could start all activities on day one, then we'd start all activities on day one. But very few projects can you start all activities on day one. You don't have the resources to do that, and you, most, most activities, rely on something else to be finished before you can do that one. So we have to, you know, we have to paint the wall and let it dry before you can hang the pictures on the wall or put the shelving on the wall or put the kitchen cabinets on the wall. There are certain precedent activities that have to occur for every project that I can think of. And so we, 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 we identify those, then we draw that on the diagram, uh, activity on node or activity on arrow, uh, then we estimate the uh, activity times and we identify the critical path, which tells us our delivery date. If we are expected to deliver before the critical path projects that we can deliver, we have a problem. We have to manage that on day one in the problem, try to see where can I buy time, how can I do this in some other way. Most of the time there is another way, but we want everybody to know that as early in the project as we can. So that's why we do this planning up front so we can talk about the schedules, we can talk about the deliverables, and we can talk about the dates. And if people start to have problems with dates, I'd much rather know it before we've done anything than after we're in the middle and we're scrambling to try to survive. Uh, we will schedule that stuff and we'll update the schedule because it rained. Tuesday and we didn't think it was gonna. And that had an impact on the project. Or COVID hit and the crew got sick. That had an impact on the project. So whatever the schedule updating needs to be done, that is something that, that we want to do. Uh, the work breakdown structure, 
that you are going to do is the map of those activities, and usually it's pretty not fancy, just boxes connected to each other, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, it looks kind of like an org chart, and it's boxes connected to each other. And th we, we call that decomposing the work, meaning we break the work down into the smallest bite sizes that we can, so that, that we know exactly uh, how we're predicting where we're getting the time. When somebody sits back and they go, well, that thing will take us three months. I'll bet against that. You gotta be wrong. <laughs> that's 90 days, that's uh, how many hours? Uh, that's, you're off one way or the other. It's gonna take longer than that or you're gonna come in quicker than that. That was an estimate, that was a guess. Now if I do all the work and I add it all up and say, I got 90.1 days to do this. And I'm going, okay, let's make that 90. We're gonna make up that point one somewhere, right? And so now you're driving facts instead of guessing. And I don't want guesses, so we do a work breakdown structure in the finest uh, 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 sense uh, that, so that we can, we, can, uh, we can agree with their estimates. We can go, yeah, I, that, I could see how that would take that long. It takes two hours to drive to Vegas. We're gonna have to load the truck and we're gonna drive back. So that piece of getting materials of marble, the granite for the countertops, to get the granite from Vegas to here, that's gonna take us uh, half a day. No, it's not gonna, you can't do it in half a day. It's gonna take three quarters of a day or maybe you say it's gonna take an entire day. Uh, and, but you buy that because you know what has to be done in order to do that, and in your brain go, there's an hour time difference, you're gonna lose and gain it. Yeah, okay, that, that we can do it. You know, four hours driving, a little bit of time waiting, you gotta have lunch, you gotta get fuel, and uh, you gotta wait for them to load this thing with a forklift. So that, that's, a, that's a reasonable amount of time because you broke that work down into bite-sized pieces that we can, we can then evaluate. And then we can drive them differently if we want to. Uh, if we're going to make two trips, we could make one trip of two trucks, right? In, or two trips in sequence and, you know, make a one day, a two day job, a one day job, right? But throwing another truck at it, but it makes it cost more. So you know, these are the kinds of things that we will be talking about with that. Uh, this is what the work breakdown structure looks like. We've talked about this most recently. Uh, and, and so, you know, often uh, this has each of the areas of your Christmas party in it, maybe. Uh, so that you would have it broken down into food and entertainment and logistics of the site, you know, whatever, whatever things you might think of would be good block headings for the drop downs on your work breakdown structure. Later, we don't know if, if this, you know, these activities in here can be done at the same time as those activities in there. Notice that this is not saying exactly what has to be done. This is saying the type of work that fits in that area, right? And then you're gonna break that down into actual activities from the work breakdown structure. Um, and we're gonna put them in order. We're gonna do that, which is what we've been doing. And um, uh, we've talked about those dependencies, finish to start, start to start, finish, finish, start to finish, uh, we, we saw the start-start relationship in one of our examples that we went through on Tuesday yesterday. <clears throat> do you want us to do this with the planning of the party, or do you want the actual party itself broken down into times also, like when it starts? The, the, the work breakdown structure is areas of activities, and then your actual activities that you map are the real things that have to happen. So you want us to show how we're planning it, and then the actual time for the party also, like dinner starts at seven yes. and we have the program. That's oh, part okay. of the planning that needs okay. to be done. Okay, we yeah. Can yeah, yeah, you would add that into, if it matters. Okay. You know, if you, you know, we're gonna just party till the cops come, mm -hmm. then, you know, then that's a different milestone, okay. you know, <laughs> when, when that one gets done. Okay. Uh, all right, so we've talked about this recently. I'm gonna stop this uh, because this is right where we are at. Uh, with practice, we're not going to do the practice. I wanted to catch us all up to date on where we are, and I think it's time for us to take a break. We'll take a break. We'll come back, and we're going to look at at how uh, we gain time, how we crash a project. And we're going to watch that through video first, and then we're going to talk about it. And that'll probably take us to the end of the day. So let's take a break right now. We'll see you back about that. I hope you can remember ten percent of that.
So yeah, I'm constantly like, I have a calendar. It's just you're like, managing the project. Yeah, that's what it's about. Like this week, we're like, we want to take the technician because this guy didn't show up on Monday, so we need him over here. But then this guy wants the flooring, but the flooring guy didn't show up at this time. But now this person wants to reschedule. So it's like at the beginning of the month, I have this like rough idea. I'm like, this is how ideally it should go. And then in the week, it's like, yeah, it goes up. And this person canceled their work order, and well, this term wants to be moved up. And this person canceled to switch apartments. Yeah, so I'm always adapting, like, every day it seems like my yeah. calendar just switches, yep. so. said no, but since we've got new groups, new people inserted into the groups, we'll take a little time today before we're done. Exciting ahead of you.
think we're all back. Um, I'm going to pass out a sheet uh, for you to look at. This will be uh, an assignment, but we are, you don't have to do this at home. You can look at it, though, uh, and bring it back to class on Tuesday. Take one of those and pass it around, if you would, please. And I'm going to review what the There's three diagrams I want us to build. And this is what the exercise is. This is what I'm handing out. Uh, there are three exercises here. And maybe this will pay a little bit more attention to the video that we're about to watch on, on crashing activities in our project plan. On exercise number one, you're given the following information about a project consisting of seven activities. The seven activities are listed. The predecessor for each activity is listed, or predecessors. The duration in weeks of each activity. And you are going to construct a project network, find the earliest time, latest time, slack for each of the activities. You're going to determine the critical path. Um, and if all other activities take the estimated amount of time, what is the maximum duration of activity D without delaying the completion of the product, so a project? So you're going to look at that's number one. Number two, you're in charge of organizing a training seminar for the sales department in your company. Remembering the project management tool and company, you have come up with the following list of activities, as in table two. You're finding all the paths and path links through the project network. Which of these paths is a critical path? What's the earliest time, latest time, and slack for each of the activities? Use the information to determine which of the paths is the critical path. Uh, there are these activities, and we named them by description rather than just a task uh, letter. This time, we have an actually what it is. You're going to select location, obtain a keynote speaker, obtain other speakers, coordinate travel for the keynote speaker, coordinate travel for the other speakers. You're going to arrange dinner. You're going to negotiate hotel rates. You're going to prepare a training booklet. You're going to distribute the training booklet. You're going to take reservations, and you're going to prepare handouts from the speaker. Uh, so those are activities to do the sales thing. Uh, and then after you've done that, and answer the questions up here, A and B, uh, there's an, uh-oh, uh -oh, the proposed date for the training seminar has been pushed up. Training seminar now needs to be prepared in less time. Activities with a duration of one week cannot be crashed anymore, but what is scheduled for two or three weeks can be crashed by one week. Activity K can be crashed by two weeks. Given a unit crashing cost of $3,000 for activities C, D, and H, $5,000 for activities J and K, and $6,000 for activities E and F. What does it cost to shorten the project by one week? What would it cost to shorten it by two weeks? That is activity crashing and the financial impact of it. The third one is a little bit more involved, but it's also involving crashing. As a project manager for Good Stuff Enterprises, we have responsibility for development of a new series of advanced intelligent toys for kids called Master Blaster. Based on a preliminary idea, top management has given us the green light to a more thorough feasibility study. As the toy should be ready before the Christmas season, we've been asked to investigate if we can finish the project in 30 weeks. The tasks that need to be carried out during the project have been broken down to a set of individual atomic tasks called activities. By atomic, we're kind of referring to that it means that, uh, that we're down to the molecular level, right, of a, of a job. Uh, so th that's atomic, that's called atomic level. Uh, for each activity, we need to know the duration of the activity and some immediate predecessors. For the Master Blaster project, the activities and their data can be seen in table three. We are supposed to derive an activity on node, project network for the project, find the earliest and latest start and finish times, which activities are on the critical path. So we gotta do product design, market research, production analysis, product model, uh, marketing material, cost analysis, product testing, sales training, pricing, and a project report. And we have the predecessors and the duration in weeks for each of those. The tasks that we have to do, top management reviews our project plan and comes up with an offer. They think 28 weeks will make the product available very late in comparison with the main competitors. 
They offer an incentive of $40,000 if the project could be finished in 25 weeks or earlier. Quickly, we evaluate every activity in our project to estimate the cost of crashing and by how much we can crash each of the activities. The numbers for a project are shown in figure four. So we have unit crashing costs here uh, for uh, the normal duration. And if we crash, uh, what happens as a result of that? What kind of speed do we gain? What's the cheapest way of reducing the project duration to 25 weeks and how? Uh, do we take the offer by management? Let's assume that the incentive scheme set forward by the top management instead of giving us a fixed date and a bonus specified, a specified daily bonus. Suppose that we will get $8,500 for each week we pre reduce the project length. Describe how this can be solved in our model and what the solution to the project will be. Construct the project crashing curve that presents the relationship between project length and the cost of crashing until the project is crashed by four weeks. Now right this second, we don't know how to do that. Uh, you know how to do the first one. Second one you could probably wing through, and the third one is uh, a little bit more of a head scratcher. You won't do this alone, but over the weekend, if you get a minute, think about what you've got to do, or watching the video, think about what we're going to be doing on Tuesday. Uh, you might, if you want to sketch some uh, relationship diagrams and so forth, you can do that. It's not an assignment that you have to do it. So if you have a slack minute during the weekend and you want to think about that, you certainly can do this. Uh, we're trying to learn something how to look like a pro to our bosses. So that's the purpose of what we're doing there. Uh, then we will pair up into teams uh, of two, you and a partner on Tuesday, and we will work these three answers out, and um, you'll compare with another team to see if you're on the right track for your answer. So that's, that's kind of what's ahead of us. Let's take a look at, at how this is done, at least one way how it's done. Uh, and we call it, it fits under the category of project acceleration. So you can see instead of the 30 weeks, we propose 28 weeks on that third project. Management goes, E, that's a little bit close. We want to market for, you know, Christmas, which means we need to be in the Black Friday sales, right, that are coming up. And, and uh, uh, so we want, to, we want to get the project done faster. How do we do that? And that's where we come in and we show them our skills. So we're going to watch this. Then we'll spend a few minutes with our Christmas planning project and we'll be done for today. In this tutorial, we're going to look at project acceleration or what's also known as activity crashing. So what we have here in front of us is we've got a project network diagram that has already been created. We can see all the different activity precedences. We can see the critical path because the critical path method has also been applied. And we can see the critical path at the moment is A, C, E, I, and J. All of these different subscripts of numbers as well, they show the different durations of all the different activities as well. So if you're interested in the critical path analysis or the critical path method, that's been dealt with in a previous tutorial. So if you want to go back to my YouTube channel and just look for that uh, tutorial to help you out there. The scenario for project acceleration would be if a client or a manager comes back to you and says, I understand that you've done the critical path method on the different activities with their normal tools at the moment. But we have other information that tells us we have to bring this project in earlier. We have to crash this down to a shorter amount of the time or accelerate the project to make sure that it comes in in a shorter amount of duration. And so as a project manager, that means that you have to go back to the drawing board. And it usually means that you realize that, yes, certainly a lot of these different activities can be done in a shorter amount of time, but it will, it's going to cost more to do those activities in that shorter amount of time. I'm going to have to reorganize my resources. And we need to start balancing off all of these different factors uh, to weigh in and decide what exactly is the best, the optimum schedule based on the different types of incentives and costs that are on the table. For this example that I'm going to go through, let's look at all the different numbers, the different figures that are available to us based on these normal durations versus crash durations. And so usually what we're done with is we've first of all got something that looks a lot like the work breakdown schedule that we would have done in the critical path analysis. We've got all the different activity codes here, and we've got all the different normal durations of each of those different activities. So we can see that these map onto the different subscripts of numbers that I have on the different activities here in my project network diagram. And then 
Beside that, we've listed all the different crash situations that we could possibly have out of these different activities. So for instance, my normal duration of activity A is two days. That would be the normal duration that it would take to complete this task given the resources or the different personnel that have allotted to that task. I have decided as a project manager and when I've looked at it and investigated more closely that I can possibly crash this activity down to one day if I really need to. Let's look at activity B. Activity B, I've got a normal duration of eight days. I could possibly, having looked at it a little bit closer, that I can possibly crash it down to crack to, to six days if I absolutely need to. But that's it. That six days is the limit. For whatever constraints are on that activity, I cannot crash it down below six days. It's just not possible to do that activity in less than six days. And then, one more example is down here in activity H. Activity H, the normal duration of that is one day, and I can't crash it any more than that. For whatever reason, the normal duration is the actual limit in terms of how fast I can complete that task. The next two columns over, which is the normal cost and the crash cost, the symbol here is just a euro symbol, you could alternatively just put in the dollar symbol if you wanted to. But the normal cost is just based on the normal duration, what I had initially estimated would be the actual cost of completing that task, based on whatever different personnel or machinery or resources I'd have put towards completing that task. So we can see here in activity A, the normal cost will be 5 euro. Now, based on activity A, I know, like I've said before, that we can possibly crash it down to one day if we need to. The cost of completing that task in one day is different and probably more expensive than it would have been if I had actually just done it in the normal duration. And so the estimated cost of crashing it to one day, completing that task in one day, is 15 euro. And again, I've got all of the different normal versus crash cost of all the different activities estimated by me, the project manager here. Something else that we're going to add into this example is just the idea of an incentive to try and incentivize me, the project manager, to bring this project in in, in an earlier amount of time or a shorter amount of time. And the incentive is listed here, just in this question. When the client came back to me and says, we need to try and get this in in a, in a lesser amount of time, the incentive to you is, is that every day that you bring this project in early, I'm going to hand you back eight euro. I'm going to give you a bonus of eight euro. Now we'll see later on where we bring that into account. So that's all the information that has been given to us. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put forward a strategy of how we're going to complete this assignment, this example. If I look back at my project network diagram, I can see that the critical path has already been identified. Because this critical path, if I start changing the different numbers by crashing different activities with different amounts of days, so for instance with activity G, activity I, activity J, if I start reducing those numbers of the normal durations down by a day at a time, the whole path structure of the network diagram changes. And that means that every time that I change numbers, it's possible that the critical path might change. I have to keep a track of that. Also, I have to keep a track of the numbers in terms of the costs the, versus the bonuses that I have uh, available to me. So I want to have two different tables besides the tables that I have here in terms of keeping track of, first of all, the costs. So this is the table that I'm going to use to keep track of that. And also this table here to keep track of my project paths to see if my critical path is changing or if I'm getting double critical paths at any stage. To give you an example of how to keep track of my costs, I'm going to fill in the first line straight away. And I'm going to fill it out for the normal duration before I've crashed any of the different activities. So the normal duration of the overall project that I have at the moment, based on the critical path that I see here before me, highlighted in red, is the sum of all of the different activity durations that are on the critical path. That is the overall duration of the project, of any project that you have. So, to find out what the overall duration of the project is, I'm going to add up all of those different activity durations. So, 2 plus 3 plus 10 is 15, plus 3 is 18, plus 2 is 20. And I'm going to go back into my table and say, yes, the duration of the normal critical path is 20 days. I haven't crashed any activities yet. So I'm going to put a hyphen in there. 
At the direct cost, the direct cost is by completing every different activity with the normal amount of cost because I haven't crashed any activities yet. If I just sum all of those different values there, I get the value down here at the bottom, which is 115. So at the moment, my direct cost is that, 115 euro. The opportunity cost or the bonus, we haven't crashed any of the different activities yet, so I'm going to put a hyphen in there as well. And so the total cost at the moment is 115 euro. That's how much it would cost to actually complete this project based on the normal duration, based on the normal different costs that I have there before me. Now, down to this third table here, which is the project paths, I want to set up my table so that I can keep track of all of the different durations of each of the different paths in the project. So we'll start, first of all, by just recording what the critical path is and the normal duration is of that path. So again, I'm going to go back to my network diagram, pick up my critical path, which is A, C, E, I, and J. So I'm going to go back and record that. Uh, A, C, E, I, and J. And the normal duration, the normal duration that we had was 20 days. And again, that is just the sum of all the different activity durations that are of the activities that are on the critical path. But as you'll see when we go forward in the example, you'll see that we have to keep track of all of the different paths in the project, not just the critical path. So I have to pick out all of the other different paths in my project as well, and again, add up all the durations of, each of those paths. So the next path that isn't the critical path, I'm going to go along the top here, which is A, C, D, G, I, and J. And again, I'm picking out any possible way it it, it allows me to go from the start node of a network diagram to the end node of the network diagram. They are all paths in their own right. So A, C, D, G, I, and J. And I'm just going to record that. A, C, D, G, I, and J. And the normal duration of that, again, I'm going to add up all of the different activity durations on that path. So 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 2 is 7, plus 4 is 11, plus 3 is 14, plus 2 is 16. So back in, the normal duration of that path is 16. The next path I'm going to look at is A, C, E, H, and J. So I need to count that one as well. So again, I'm going to go back to my table and fill that in. And again, count up the normal duration of that path. 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 10 is 15, plus 1 is 16, plus 2 is 18. 18. Next path is A, C, F, H, and J. And the normal duration of that path is 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 4 is 9, plus 1 is 10, plus 2 is 12. So, 12. And the next path is B, F, H, and J. And the duration of that path is 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 1 is 13, plus 2 is 15. And so I've got five different pathways through that project network diagram at the moment. There is no other way that I can get from the start mode, follow through a path and get to the end node. I've recorded all of the different paths and I've added up all of the different durations of each of the different activities on each of those paths to get the actual normal durations of all those paths. So we can see here why the critical path, again, is the critical path. It's the path that takes the longest amount of time. All of these other paths, compared to the overall project duration, which is the duration of the critical path, they all have a little bit of slippage, meaning that they have a little bit of leeway that if any of those different tasks slip a little bit, the overall project duration won't slip. So the overall project duration is the normal duration of the critical path, which is 20 days. At this stage, we're almost ready to start thinking about crashing different activities. But before we do that, again, I want to go back here and think about this normal versus crashed uh, amount of money here in terms of cost. We want to really keep track of exactly how much it's going to cost us to crash each of these different activities. And the whole idea behind it is, is we prioritize the ones that is going to allow us to crash the overall project duration, but is also going to allow us to do that with the least amount of cost to us. Now, if the project that you are dealing with, if cost isn't an issue and it's just absolutely essential that you have to uh, crash the project, no matter what the cost is, then this step doesn't really matter that much. 
But as we all know, money talks. So usually cost is a big factor. And the way that we have put down the cost so far in terms of normal versus the crashed amount of money here is with the example of activity E, for instance, I've got a normal amount of 20 euro. So to complete the task E in 10 days, that would cost me 20 euro. If I wanted to complete the task E in six days, then it's going to cost a lot more. It's going to cost me 40 euro. Because I need to peel back the actual project day by day because of the nature of the changing critical paths to keep track of it, I need to keep a track of exactly how much it's going to cost me uh, to crash each activity by a single day, rather than this idea of having just this one's going to cost me an extra 20 euro to crash it by, by, by four days. So to do that, based on the figures that I have at the moment, I'm just going to kind of get a rough estimate and I'm going to say, well, if it costs me 20 euro to crash um, the activity E by four days, then to crash it by one day, I'm just going to take 20 euro, divide it by four, and to give me the figure five euro. So on average, roughly, it will cost me five euro to crash activity E by each single day that I'm allowed to crash it by. Now, based on these examples, I usually do that logic in my head, but I could easily write out a formula to help me do it if I wanted to. So, just give myself a little bit of room here. And what I'm going to do is, what the, what the calculation was there that I just did, I'm just going to say the crash amount, which is crash euro, subtract the normal amount, whatever that normal cost is, uh, put that in brackets, and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to divide in the normal duration minus the crash duration. This will give me the expedite cost slope. So again, if I went through the example of activity E there again, just to check my figures, the crashed amount, which is 40, minus the normal amount, which is 20 euro, that will give me 20. Then divide that by the normal duration, which is 10, minus the crash duration, which is 6, that will give me 4. 20 divided by 4 gives me 5, which is the expedite cost slope of that activity. So I want to apply that formula or apply that logic to each of those different activities all the way down. So activity A, first of all, uh, the crash duration is 15, minus the normal duration is 5, that gives me 10, divided by 1 is 10 euro. Uh, in activity B, it's going to cost me 22 euro to do it in a normal duration of eight days, and 32 euro to cost me to crash it to six days. Then the expedite cost of that is eight divided by two is four. Next one is three divided by one, which is three. Activity D is six divided by one, which is six. Already done activity E. Activity F is 15 minus 8, which is 7. 7 divided by 1 is 7. Activity G is 10 minus 9 is 1, divided by 1 is 1. Activity H is 10, and 10, now hold on, activity H actually can't be crashed, so that's pointless, we'll just put a hyphen there. Uh, activity I is 10 minus 8, which is 2. 2 divided by 1 is 2. And then activity J, 20 minus 12 is 8. 8 divided by 1 is 8. So we can see a lot more clearly roughly how much it costs us to crash each of the different activities per day. So because I'm going to peel back this project day by day, I can see the cheapest activities that I can crash first of all. Now, if I look at all of those different expedite cost slopes for each of the different activities, I can see one that stands out, which is activity G. It's the cheapest one to crash. And my first incentive might be to crash that activity G. But we have to be careful. And here is where the skill in terms of accelerating projects has come in. If I go back to my project network diagram, and I look at my layout, and I look at my critical path, activity G isn't on the critical path. So even though it doesn't cost me a whole lot to crash that activity, and I can crash it from four days down to three days, if I do that, the overall project duration won't come down at all, because the overall project duration is defined or dictated by the duration of the critical path. 
because G is not that critical path, I can crash it all I want, but it's not going to bring the project in any sooner. And here's where the importance of the critical path raises its head again. This shows you how important this critical path is as a project manager. The critical path is the one that dictates how long the overall project will take. And so if I was to crash G, all that would happen is, is that I would just get more slack on that path. I would get more slack around path or around activity G. The overall project duration wouldn't change. So it's not an option for me as a project manager because I won't get my bonus if I crash G the way that it is at the moment. So I have to go back again and look at all my different activities, but really only look at activities that are on the critical path because they are the ones that are going to make a difference to the overall project duration. So A, C, E, I, and J. If I look at the expedite cost slopes of each one of those, A, C, E, I, and J. So again, I see out of those five different activities, activity I is the cheapest one. And I can see I have the opportunity to crash I from three days down to two days. It will cost me two euros to do that. Two extra euros, if you like. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the cheapest one that is on the critical path. So I'm going to move down and I'm going to start into that process. So on my second table here, which has to do with costs, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to crash activity I. Because it's on the critical path, it's going to bring down the overall project duration by one day, which will bring it down to 19. The activity crashed is I. Now, as well as putting in I in there, because I has only got one day in which I can crash it. Once I crash it down to two days, that's it. I can't crash it anymore. So to keep track of that, usually when that happens, I put in a little asterisk into it just to say that this activity has been crashed to the limit. I can't crash it any more than that. The direct cost. Well, the direct cost of doing this project in the way that it is, crashing I by one day and having all the other costs of all the different activities which were there before, I'm just going to be adding an extra two euro onto the overall cost that was there originally. So it's 115 euro plus the extra two euro to crash activity I by one day, which will give me 117 euro. The bonus or the opportunity cost, my client has offered me eight euro for every day I bring this project in early. I want to balance off the cost of my activity versus the actual bonuses that I get on the other hand. And so what I'm going to say here is I'm going to put in minus 8 there. So my overall cost, if I do this, will be 117 minus 8, which will be 109 euro. And what I'm trying to do is I'm going to try and bring the overall total cost of my whole project as low as possible. And then that's when I know um, I've got the optimum schedule for my scenario. Just as we've taken a look at the costs and we're keeping track of the costs, as we pull back the actual project duration one day at a time, we also have to keep an eye on what's happening to our project paths. So again, just to point out, in my project network diagram, this was the original layout. I did my critical path analysis. I defined what my critical path was. Now that I've changed one of these numbers, the actual duration of one of these activities. Well, you can imagine the effect that that would have had on my critical path analysis if I were to do it again. Rather than do the critical path analysis every single time I change one of the numbers, which would be really laborious, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm just going to keep an eye on what's happening to each of the different paths that are on my project network diagram to see the effect that changing the duration of I will have. So for instance, in the critical path, which is this first project path that I've listed here, the normal duration with I having a normal duration of 3 give me an overall project duration of 20. But once I crash I, and again I'm just going to go I and asterisk there, that now, because I is on that path, that 20 reduces to 19 because I've crashed I from 3 days down to 2 days. And it will have the same effect for all the other paths that I is on they will all reduce their durations by one. So I'm going to look down through all of my different paths. Any of those paths that have I on them, it's going to reduce their project duration by one. So this path here had a normal duration of 16. Because I is on it, that now goes down to 15. I isn't on this path. 
So that path duration stays the same, stays at 18. This path also doesn't have I, so that path stays at 12. And this path stays at 15 because I isn't on that one either. So I'm keeping track of what my paths are looking like. At the moment, after I've crashed I by one day, this still remains the critical path. But the overall duration of that critical path is 19. And therefore, as we've seen, the overall project duration is 19. Now that I've crashed my project by one day, I'm going to go back and look for the next thing that I'm going to crash, the next activity that I can crash. Again, it has to be on the critical path. I has got been completely crashed out, so I don't or can't look at I anymore because that's been crashed out to two and that's the limit on it. That was that one. The next sheep is there is C. And so, again, I'm going to look at C. C is on the critical path, so it definitely is a contender. There's no other activity there that is on the critical path and is cheaper than C. Looking at the way that I can crash C, at the moment the normal duration is three days, I can possibly crash it down to two days if I want. It has a normal cost of 10 euro. It, the crash cost if I was to crash it down to two days is 13 euro. So that's the next best activity that I can crash. And so let's go about it. Remember that I've only got one day to play with here. So again, the duration of the project once I crash C by one day is 18. The activity crashed is C, asterisk because it can't be crashed anymore, just so I can keep track of that. The overall cost is three euro to crash it by that extra day. So add three euro to 117. The overall cost of the project now is 120 euro. Because I'm bringing it in another day early, that is two days early, I'm going to get double the bonus. So now my bonus is 16, so my opportunity cost is minus 16 euro. And so the overall total cost of my project is 104 euro. And again, that's what I like to see, that the cost is going down for me. That's the barometer, that's the litmus test to see the best or optimum schedule for me, the project manager. I have to keep track of my of my paths as well. So I'm going to go down to my project paths list. Again, I'm going to list the activity that I crashed. Any of these paths that have C on it, they're all going to reduce by one day. So the critical path, that reduces from 19 down to 18 because C is on it. This path goes from 15 down to 14. This path has C on it, so that goes from 18 down to 17. This path, has C on it, so that goes from 12 down to 11. And this path doesn't have C on it, so that stays at 15. Okay. We can still see that the critical path structure is still the same, that that path here at the top still has the longest duration, A, C, E, I, and J, so it is still the critical path. Now, I'm gonna move back up and pick out my next best activity that I can craft. Activity C is now maxed out, so I'm going to put an asterisk beside that. And so, A, C, E, I, and J were the activities that were on the critical path. So the next cheapest item on that is activity E, at a cost of five euro a day. And this time, I've got a little bit more to play with here. I can crash it by four days in total. So I'm going to do that again, the duration here. It reduces from 18 down to 17. I'm going to crash E, no asterisks this time because I've got other days to play with after I crash it by one day. The overall cost of crashing activity E by one day at a time is 5 euro. So that's the direct cost is 120 euro plus 5 is 125 euro. Because I'm bringing it in three days early, I'm going to get a bonus of 24 euro. So my opportunity cost is minus 24. And so my total cost is 101. And so again, it's going in the right direction. So that's good. Again, I'm going to keep track of how my project paths are looking. So any of these paths that contain um, the activity E, they're all going to reduce by one day. So the critical path, obviously that has E. So that's going to reduce from 18 down to 17. This path here doesn't have E. E isn't on that, so that stays at 14. This path here does have E, that goes from 17 down to 16. This path doesn't have E, so that stays at 11. And the last path stays at 15. E isn't on that either. 
So again, keeping track that yes, my critical path is still the same. Yes, it is. So I can keep going. And again, I don't need to go and pick another activity. I've still got more to play here with E. So I can crash E by another day. So straight away, I'm going to crash E by another day. So bringing the whole overall project duration from 17 down to 16, crashing E by another day. It's going to cost me 130 euro. The opportunity cost is minus 32. And the overall cost there is 98 euro. Going in the right direction, everything is good. Again, I'm going to keep track of crashing E by another day, how that's going to change my different paths. So again, the critical path is going to reduce by one day. That goes from 17 down to 16. It's not on that path, so that stays at 14. E is on this path, so that goes from 16 down to 15. It isn't on this path, so that stays at 11. And E isn't on the last path, so that stays at 15. Again, my critical path is still the same. It's still the moment of the longest duration, so I can keep going. I'm going to crash E by another day. So it's from 16 down to 15. Crashing E by another day. I've only got one more day to play with after this. The direct cost is another five euro for the extra day that I'm crashing. It's 130 plus five is 135. The opportunity cost is another eight euro, so minus 40. 135 minus 40 is 95 euro. Going in the right direction all the time. It's all looking good for me, the project manager. I'm going to keep track of how this crashing of E by an extra day is going to change my paths, if, if at all. And so again, my critical path, it is on that, so that goes from 16 down to 15. It isn't on this next path, so that stays at 14. The next path, it is on that path, so that goes from 15 down to 14. The next path, E, isn't on that path, so that stays at 11. And the next path here, B, F, H, J, it isn't on that path, so that stays at 15. Now, here we go. This is why we do this table down here. We can see that this was the original critical path. I've crashed lots of different activities, and I was keeping track of how the different path durations was, were, were moving based on the different activities I was crashing. This path down here at the bottom, the B, F, H, and J, that has suddenly now got a duration of 15 days, as well as the critical path. So if I go back to my project network diagram, and I pick out that path, B, F, H, and J. That ha also now has become critical. It has a duration of 15 days, just like this original critical path has as well. So what I have is got, I've got a dual critical path. I've got two paths that have the same duration. And so that complicates things when I want to accelerate a project. Because now I have to make sure that I crash both of those paths by one day at the same time because for instance if I was to crash an activity on one of those paths and not crash an activity on another path then it wouldn't make any difference because one activity was on one of the critical paths because the other critical path would remain the same and so therefore the overall project duration would remain the same as well and that's not what I'm looking for so I have to go back here to my activities and say does it make sense anymore to crash E by its last day? So I've already crashed it by three days, but can I crash it by another day to get the effect that I'm looking for? Well, let's look at it. If I go back to my network diagram again and look at activity E, this bottom path now has become critical as well. So even though I've got another day to crash E by and it only costs five euro, it's not gonna make any difference to the overall project duration because it's not on this bottom path. And if I went and I crashed E, and I went down here to uh, my table that keeps track of all my paths, this critical path would reduce from 15 down to 14. But this path would stay the same. And so therefore, this path would have the largest duration. That would be the critical path. And so the overall project duration would remain at 15, even though I had crashed E by a day. So I wouldn't get my bonus and it would be futile to do that. So now, does that mean we're completely 
halted or scuppered and I can't do anything else? Well, no, not exactly, but it just think, makes things a little bit more complicated. I essentially have two options. I can look for an activity that is on both paths at the same time. So let's see if there's any contenders for that. This is the first critical path. This is the second critical path. And so there's only one contender for an activity that's actually on both paths. And if you think about it, that would make sense. If I was to crash J by a day, that would mean that both of those critical paths on my table of critical paths would reduce by one because J is on both of those paths. In actuality, J is on every path. So by reducing J by one day, I would be bringing back the overall project duration by one day and I would get my bonus. So that's option number one. Option number two is again if I look at my project network diagram and rather than crashing J, if I pick one activity on each of the different paths and crash them both simultaneously, then that would have the same effect. So for instance, if I were to crash activity B, which is on this lower path, and activity E, which is on the original critical path, and if I was to crash them both simultaneously, the effect on my project paths will be similar. And again, I'm just going to focus on those two paths. So E is on the first, our original critical path. And so that would reduce by one day from 15 down to 14. And B is on this new critical path. So that also would reduce from 15 down to 14. And so therefore, the overall project duration would reduce from 15 down to 14, and I would get my extra day's bonus. So that's another option. Which of those two options should I choose? Well, this is where the costs come in. And this is where it's useful to actually put in costs in all my calculations. Because out of those two options, as a project manager, I want to do the one that is best for me or most beneficial to me financially. And so if I look at crashing J will cost eight euro. Crashing B and E together will cost the combination of those two crashed costs. So four and five, four plus five is nine. So crashing B and E will cost me nine euro to do it per day, but crashing J will only cost me eight. So the best option is to crash J by one day. And I can see that that's all I have with it. I can only crash it by one day. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, to bring the overall project duration from 15 down to 14, I'm going to cra crash pro uh, activity J, J asterisk because I've only one day to play with and this would be it maxed out. It's gonna cost me eight euro. So 135 plus, plus eight is 143. I'm gonna get another day's bonus for that. So minus 48. And so 143 minus 48 gives me 95. Now you can see here probably already, because it's costing me 8 euro to crash J, and I'm only getting 8 euros of bonus, well, that's not gonna make much difference to me financially. So we're keeping an eye on that, but let's go ahead, anyway, keep a track of the project paths, so we can see how it plays out. J asterisk, J is on all of these different paths, so all of these different numbers here are going to reduce by one. So 15 goes to 14, 14 goes to 13, 14 goes to 13 on that path, 11 goes to 10, and that last path, 15, goes to 14. So I have reduced the overall project duration by one day, because again, those two paths, this path here, and this new critical path here, they're still the two paths with the highest durations. J has been maxed out now. I can't crash it anymore. So let's just for argument's sake go on to the other option that I was talking about before, which was just this B and E, crashing both of those simultaneously because E is on the first original critical path, B is on this new critical path. If I bring them back or peel them back one day at a time each, the overall project duration will come back by a day. So B and E together they cost four plus five, which is nine euro. 
So let's try that out. The overall duration will come from 14 down to 13. The different activities crashed is B, which I don't know if I've maxed that out. B, no, I've got two days to play with there, so I'm going to leave it like that. B, comma, E, which is the last day I can crash E with. So I'll put an asterisk beside that because I've crashed it three days already and I can only crash it by four. So B and E together cost nine euro. So 143 euro plus nine is 152. Another eight euro will be given back to me by the client by crashing it for another day. So that's minus 56. And so the total cost is 152 minus 56, which is 96 euro. So I can see again, this total cost, it's starting to creep back up. So the optimum schedule is one of these two, but let's keep going anyway. Just let's see the effects of crashing B and E together. It will help us if you're trying to do one of these other uh, activity crashing or project acceleration uh, questions again. So keeping track of my paths, B was crashed and E was also crashed at the same time. E is on this path, so that goes from 14 down to 13. Neither E nor B is on this second path, so that stays at 13. E is on this third path, so that goes from 13 down to 12. Neither E nor B is on this fourth path, so that stays at 10. B is on this last path, so that goes from 14 down to 13. So again, I've achieved what I set out to achieve by crashing those two activities. The overall project duration has come back by one day. But at the same time, I've got another critical path has arisen. So now I've got three critical paths, which is perfectly feasible. It's perfectly possible to have that. I can have lots of different critical paths all at the same time. And so if I were to go any further, I would again have to apply the same logic, but make sure that each of those three different critical paths were being brought back together. Otherwise, the overall project duration wouldn't be changing. But it doesn't matter in terms of this question, because essentially we got what we, we were looking for, which is we've got a low point here. In terms of total cost to me, the project manager, when I'm balancing out the cost of crashing activities and the actual amount of money that I've been getting from the client in terms of a bonus. I've got these two options here. They're both costing me 95 euro. So you might be asking, well, what's the correct answer? What's the optimum schedule? Well, here's where your discretion could come into play. But the way that I would argue it is I would say that it's costing me the same 95 euro. The project client probably would like it in the that day earlier. So I would go for this option here, bringing the overall project duration in at 14 days with a total cost to me, the project manager of 95 euro. And again, just to write that out, optimum schedule at a total cost of 95 euro for 14 days in duration. And this was achieved by crashing I by one day, C by one day, E, now just be careful here, we're going for this option here, so at that stage we had only crashed E by three days. And finally J by one day. And giving as much information as possible to the project managers that are working with me or to my client, we should also list that the critical path structure has changed slightly. Everyone take note of that. Critical path is, well, we've got this critical path, and we have this other critical path as well. That last critical path that cropped up didn't crop up at the, uh, at the node, at the point that we were taking note of. So I'm just going to list these two critical paths, um, there's two paths there. And that's an example of how to achieve project acceleration or is also known as activity crashing. Good luck in your questions. All right, that was a rather long video, and, and uh, but it went through quite a bit of math that the repetition gives us a chance. We're going to have two, two questions, two examples, where we are going to be crashing and having to associate a cost with it. 
And so that will give us a chance to do that. So hopefully that's starting to look like a powerful tool. And uh, when you, when he's, he went at minuscule pace through it so we would get it. A lot of that stuff is rather intuitive and you do it pretty fast in your head when, when it comes time to actually putting it down. If you create tables like he did, you now have something you can show the boss that says, here's what we're doing. And we have four specific action items uh, to, to, beat the, to beat the estimates on. We have to manage to those, because if they creep back up, our costs go up and our, our time deadline uh, extends back out, which is counterproductive to us. So with that, it's 7.40 right now, and I would, I would uh, like to dedicate just a little bit of time to your, your project teams regrouping, talking about your Christmas uh, party project that you've got going. Uh, come to some, stay as long as you want, come to some resolution on what your action plan is so that a week from today you can present your plan that has your, your contract in it, it's got your work breakdown structure, it's got your table of dependencies on it, it's got your map, however you map it, probably this way because we're most familiar with this way, and you have gone through it to see uh, if you can optimize that uh, at all. And so that's kind of, you're going to kind of present kind of your package, what it's about, and how you present it is, is up to your team to figure out. You can give us a handout, uh, a sheet, a written in pencil. It doesn't have to be computer generated at all. You can do something more fancy if you'd like to do that. Uh, that will be a week from today. So let's meet back with your teams. Uh, some of you will be introducing yourself to the team. You, you're, you're, re you're joining a team. And we're missing some key members as well. Uh, so uh, just get your action plan together of what you're going to do uh, as a group. And once you have uh, got to that point, you can continue to discuss as long as you would like to. But what, if you have your plan of what you're going to do next and how you're going to communicate to each other and how you're going to come to agreement on what your estimate times are going to be and your costs and that kind of stuff, um, you can go. So you're self-directed at this point. We get group with your teams. We were one, team one in that corner, team two in this, team three here, and team four up here. So take a few minutes and do that, and uh, we'll be done when you're done. Did everybody get the handout? Did that circulate all the way around for, for the assignment? Okay.
excited. <laughs>
thousand and my T two fifty missile I believe went into the Gulf of Aden. Yeah. Yeah. say from say from six to eight p.m. right? Six. From six to six thirty. So we can 
sorts of things today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you couldn't just go with okay. me, huh? Well, I mean, I can. It's just that I walked into work this, this morning, and we have a new girl. And so they have a welcoming thing. You know, part of their policy is to plan a welcoming thing. And so our manager walked in with these uh, bunch cakes, mm -hmm. and it was red. You know, one of them was red velvet with chocolate chips and uh, whatever flavor icing it was, and it was absolutely delicious. Thing. So, but then it got your sugar going. Like, right. yeah. So I was like, you know what? I've already cheated, so I might as well do it again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's, you just start again tomorrow. That's how it goes. Right. Oh. I, think I do intermittent that fasting, so like from spot. 3 to 8 o'clock, it's fair game, whatever. There you go. Yeah, that's part of the carnivore diet. Really? We started on is intermittent fasting, so I don't eat breakfast, and then, then you're not supposed to eat anything past 8. Oh, geez, did they so good. Yeah. I had uh, Cheez-Its, yeah. two starters, and uh, a small piece of bread today. <laughs> nice. Yes, got me into lunch and breakfast. I have a hard time. So now, the next, the next, oh my goodness, the next objective is going to be trying to uh, put all of this information in the chart. I'm going to delegate that task out. So yeah, they uh, called me into the office yesterday and asked me to make a decision. And they were willing to work with me on numbers. My wife doesn't agree with me staying, and I don't feel like it's the right thing to do. I feel like there's a lot more potential, you know, elsewhere. And it's a gamble. It is a gamble, but it's not. It's not that big, uh, because you can you can hedge your bets uh, with side work. It's not conflicting with uh, your what was it? Three scrubs, what was it? Three scrubs, yeah. Uh, and uh, what I mean specifically there, thrown at. If you had side work that was working on solo RV work, that's conflicting with Greg's. And right. you, don't, you don't want to go there. I would assume that you know, you'll have to do whatever you want. You're going to have to do that. Um, if he doesn't ask 
say, hire me because I'm white, uh, hire me because I don't have an accent, you can't say that, but your picture says it. Right. And and if you show, were you Marine Corps? I forgot. The Army. I was Army. 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 Yeah. So you should you, you show a picture with the flag in your, in your, you know, in your uniform, uh, or just say it, you know, retired or former or whatever your credentials are, uh, and maybe just the photo is all it's needed that says, hey, I'm
two actors than the one that they do. It's telling you how it's going to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> I agree. You know. Uh, but 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 for heavy men work, a lot of those guys are 150 men work when you look at when you break down the clip. Right. That's where they're at, and and they're getting work. So why not? Right. You know, that does pay. for the time they're down doing sales and bids. You know, somebody's sure. going to pay for that. So you pick it up that way. But I would, I would, with the uncertainty of how fast Drake will pick up for you and supply you and things, get a couple jobs and you won't ever, I mean, you can always say no to a job. You know, you can always even quit the job after you started it if you want to do that with ethically. When you just need me guarantee me 40 hours a week. Okay, well then, and, uh, don't, you're worried about nothing. His, his countenance, just, you know, spending time with him, talking with him on the phone, spending time with him and his wife, and my wife and his yeah. wife, um, they both seem like very genuine people, very honest people, yeah. and so uh, countenance is, is a huge thing to be able to judge someone off of. Yeah, it's, it's um, real value here. Just for due diligence, since your, your reputation and name is at stake here, um, if you haven't done as much background check as you need as you can, You've already done some right. Yeah, you know, I just you know you would you would kick yourself if there was some obvious flags there that you missed, you right? Because you know you can't. But um, it sounds like I mean it sounds to me like there's no advice to see you've already you've already been been diligent in what you're doing. You're praying about it, and it's coming your way, and it looks it looks awesome. So it's going to be really good. You've got um, the next week you start. See how it goes, and I'll just be shadowing for, you know, for quite, a, I think he said night, be shadowing him for 90 days, and then after that, and possibly sooner, he'll get me, he'll get me out and like actually uh, doing things on my own, you know, with increase, and then, yeah. you know, once I'm, you know, able to take care of, of when he's able to say, okay, well, I need you to go troubleshoot this problem, and, and go fix it. And so, um, a question I had for you is: Do you do you do business consulting? Right. That's, yeah. that's what you do. That's what I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what is your what is your your rate on that? I don't. Uh, or do you not have a? Set I don't rate? really have a set rate. Um, I, I it, de it depends kind of on what the job is. I I, I help people. I would want you to exhaust the free services based on where you're at right now uh, that are here. Um, that are here on campus, I'll talk to you a little bit about right. your job. And, and get into their system and uh, do the stuff, because they're very helpful, and, and you choose what you pay. You know, they, don't, they don't force you to pay for anything. And, and, uh, you know, getting your business plan together, for example, establishing your LLCs, those are things you can do uh, through their office. And then when it comes to, you know, let's say you want to <coughs> you want to put an ad together for the side business, you know, we'll talk about show me what you got, what you're thinking about, and I'll do that just as part of this class. I don't care because it gets to be a bigger project, and we just talk about it in advance. Um, I usually charge one. But 
and usually his doesn't re result in making money, and mine usually does. Um, I, I also have, for 30 years, I've said, if I ever give a client an invoice that they think is out of the line, strike it out, pay me what he agrees with. And just adjust the invoice as you see fit. And I've never had anybody do that. But it's a true offer if I invoice somebody a thousand dollars and they think it was worth five hundred, I would accept five hundred dollars to fix what they thought I didn't deliver. Um, but it's never happened, so right now. I, I mean there's value to what you do. There there is and, and I I don't want to get into something where I don't think I can add value. If if you and I talk feel like this kind of goes in line with it all, but I want to um, pressure wash or power wash, however you want to say it, driveways. So, you know, and I feel like the three of them complement each other. And so... Do you have pressure wash equipment already? No, but that's easy to get. It is. It's not so. just for them. It's the trailer mounted or truck mounted or whatever. No, but I... I so the, the trailer that I built for my food truck did the window washing contract for this college campus when we first built the building we didn't think about the ongoing cost of washing windows it was like the wind blows and it rains windows clean themselves no they don't <laughs> and and the birds you know add to the problem and so almost immediately we were faced with oh crap we're gonna have to pay somebody a lot of money we we got all class you know everybody can get all class and and so they called two or three people that weren't able, and some guy said, look, I'm just a little guy starting up. You be my account. Uh, you know, I'll do whatever I need to do to get the account. I'll buy equipment. I'll buy, I'll do whatever I need to do. And we formed a friendship with whoever was doing that building who doesn't work here anymore. And we've never put that out for bid. He's still, five years later, 
still is on a contract washing her windows. Wow. And, and, and the contract's been renewed a bunch of other times. He changed the price and what he's had to do and what our expectations have changed and all that kind of stuff. But now he's got a thriving business that's based on us as the anchor customer. You land somebody like that with pressure washing, then, you know, I mean, it's that kind of thing. That once, once Maverick, if they're set with the guy they got, they're not even going to go out. You know, the front of the of Walmart, does Walmart pressure pump their pressure wash the front of their building? I don't know if they do or not, but they should. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I bet they do. You know, corporate brands are real HOAs, you know, offering the contract deal to a trailer, all the RVs in the trailer park. You know, they they need pressure washed more than stucco homes do, but stucco homes need to be pressure washed also. They stage homes for sale. If it's a stucco home and if it's got crappy looking stucco on it, a lot of that's dirt, not that. You know. Right, exactly. And and uh, you know, letting a realtor know that there's a high end realtor that's done a lot of that's flipping a lot of houses. That's becomes part of what they expect their seller to do. So they're selling your services to their company that to their co customer that's going to list their house. So that's just added. He, he, yeah, <coughs> and it's part of, you know, they'll tell them to repaint your front door, you know, clean your driveway, clean your, this, you know, clean the house, and pressure washing is the easy way to do it. They can go to Home Depot, buy a pressure washer and do it themselves, or call this guy. You know, he'll do it, do it hassle for you. I'd say most people in St. George, I, well, I can't say most people, a lot of people in St. George would be more willing to hire someone to do work, and I'll approach you this way. Um, I have a good friend of mine who lives here who's a business owner. He uh, owns DIY pools. Um, started in California, moved here, and so now it's out of here, but he does it everywhere in the nation. He, he designs pool plans for people. Um, and something one of his dad's friends told him one time, because his dad owns uh, uh, just a simple repair facility where he does oil changes, alignments, tires, and stuff, right? Brakes. And so, you know, he, he ended up, you know, getting to a point where he was making $100 an hour. And someone asked him if he was going to change his oil, his own oil. He said, why would I save $20 an hour to change my oil when I make 100 Why would I lose $100 that I could be working for to save 20 yep. And so that's the case of a lot of people in St. George. There's a lot of money in St. George. Yep, uh, a lot of business owners, a lot of There, there, there's a do-it-yourself mentality, but in your favor, uh, those are young people, not old people. Right. The older you get, the less you want to do stuff like that, because taxes are going to go up, you know, it's just right. faster, easier, and higher, better, you know, kind of thing. And uh, a guy you need to talk to uh, here on campus, just look him up on, this, the, on, the, on the web page. Uh, his name's Steve Cooper. And... Steve taught automotive shop at, I think, Desert Hills for a lot of years. He was a high school auto mechanic shop teacher. And uh, 
Saturday work. Um, I don't know how he got connected, but he has been writing the service manuals for Hyundai. The oh, the I got it. Three that that that's his service manual. He's he's writing the freaking service manual. It's like Steve made for Hyundai. You kidding me? He goes, crazy. yeah, they can't yeah. translate it out of Korean. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they they like the way he approached service. So he's been writing the manual. He's been doing more. He could work full time for. And he's doing that from St. George. And um, so there's two or three things that Steve is entrepreneurially doing that you and he need to know each other. He needs to know that you're doing some of those things. He might have some clients to tell you that you can't, that he's just not done that on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying he does, I'm just saying he certainly has some ideas of what worked for him and what didn't. Right. And, and he's a nice guy. And I would put, I would tell him if you're not you're in my class, and then you and I have been talking. He was my boss here for a while when we built this first program, and so he knows this program well, and knows me well. Okay. Uh, and um, and and I would just suggest that you you offer to buy him Jimmy John's and sit down at Jimmy John's and visit, get to know each other, say hi, and just buy him a sandwich. I mean, I would advise that, and and, and uh, uh, that puts him off campus, so it's nothing.
he, I know he 